I thought I'd be able to introduce uh, our speaker for today, uh, Dr. David Gillespie from, uh, from the Pacific Agriculture Research Center in beautiful Agassiz, uh, British Columbia. And for those who've been up there, you know, it has been an absolutely beautiful station. I was very lucky about 20 years ago, I spent a short sabbatical with Dave and I had a wonderful experience there. So, you know, if you're ever up in that area, it is really spectacular. Dave is a native Canadian, obviously, uh, actually spent most of his time in British Columbia as both a Bachelor of Science degree in Biology, a Master's in Biology, and his PhD in Biology from Simon Fraser University. So he didn't go too far away, basically, and now he's at that Agassiz where he is a senior research scientist. So Dave's area primarily is biological control almost exclusively. He does work in, in sort of uh, field systems and with classical biological control. He has a large project now on canola, for example. But his major contribution really is focused on uh, biological control in greenhouse systems. And for those that know British Columbia, the greenhouse industry there is huge. Uh, the vegetable industry especially, so Dave has made remarkable progress in advancing biological control in vegetables, not only in BC, but literally around the world. And so what Dave has done is really, you know, investigating sort of native natural enemies, understanding them, and, and basically show how they can be used in greenhouses. And so because of that effort, a lot of what we deal with now on a commercial basis, in other words, what's available commercially, internationally, really came out of Dave's lab. So predatory mites, some predatory uh, cystomyidae, and especially the predatory demurids. A lot of that work, uh, that, a lot of biocontrol that goes on in California, but those uh, natural enemies, actually, the foundation of that work has come out of, out of Dave's lab. And not only has he developed new, new natural enemies, but you know, sort of the delivery system. So for example, a lot of how we use myridae, predation myridae in greenhouses, how we do that really has come out of that day's lab. He was uh, elected as an honorary member of IOBC, I think we call it work. And today he's gonna to be talking about a broader topic that is the influence of, of, of climate change on biological control. He is also an adjunct professor at Simon Fraser, who works very closely with, with Bernie Reutberg, that many people know, and I think Bernie's a, a little bit of uh, in, in, inherent in this, in this presentation. Oh, great. Thank you, Michael. Uh, it's a tremendous honor and pleasure to be down here and uh, coming from British Columbia where the uh, temperatures are riding in the uh, 40s, uh, if I'm lucky, at daytime highs and it's pouring rain. This is, this is lovely weather, 20 degrees and uh, no rain. It's a real treat. Um, so yeah. Uh -oh. well, <laughs> You've, uh, you've been hoping for rain, so maybe I'll bring it with me. Yeah, so this, this, what I'm going to talk about today sort of stems from work that I started a number of years ago on biological control of aphids in greenhouse peppers. And uh, we developed this, this little predator prey host system with green peach aphids that uh, we're starting to try and tease apart. Why does it work? How does it work? When an opportunity came along, to start to think about in the, in the context of perturbations and the influence of, of high temperatures on this on this system. So what I'm going to talk about today is, is some of that work where it started from what we found initially and then some, some uh, studies that are very much um, still in the wet ink stage. I've just finished collecting the last little bit of data. Um, in fact, my technicians are still processing some of the samples today, so it's going to be very recent work, which is very much unfinished, um, soggy clay, as it were. Um, so yeah, uh, biological control in the face of climate change. Um, everybody's presumably seen this graph or an iteration of it. Um, carbon dioxide temperatures are, carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere are changing. They're, they're changing dramatically in post-industrial uh, in revolution. Time. Um, and as a consequence, um, we, we see this phenomenon called global climate change. Um, an increasing uh, concentration of carbon dioxide, which is leading to changes in ocean pH, changes in global average temperatures, changes in wind patterns, changes in rain patterns, and so on and so forth. Um, and there's a sort of a, in the public consciousness, there's this global trend towards increasing temperature, and every time you get a cold day, you get the naysayers sticking up their hands. Um, but those increasing 
global mean temperatures are changing the world around us in a fairly profound way. We're seeing changes in distributions and ranges of animals, changes in seasonal activity, synchrony between parasitoid, parasitoid hosts, flowers and pollinators. We're seeing changes in overwintering survival. So we're seeing a whole host of things happening as a result of this um, increasing mean global temperature. But there's another trend underlying that, which is that as that global mean temperature changes, there's an increasing tendency towards, there's a tendency towards increasing variation around that mean temperature. So you're getting greater and greater extremes of temperature. And the models tell us then that the, the future is going to hold a, uh, a lot of, in, within, a future with increased mean temperatures is going to hold uh, the increased probability of heat waves. There, there, the heat waves will be longer, they will, will be more frequent, and they'll be more intense. And then that begs the question, well, why do we care? And the simple answer is, in part, in, in this universal relationship between temperature and a host of life history and biological phenomena. Here I've just graphed development rate as a function of temperature, something every entomologist is familiar with. Uh, we have a, a lower development threshold on the x-axis, a temperature below which the process doesn't take place in net effect. And then as temperature increases, the rate of the process increases to some upper threshold, at which point uh, it's going about as fast as it possibly can continue to increase the temperature, and we reach an upper development threshold, uh, a point above which the process, whatever it is, doesn't take place in net effect. If you think about that, extend that x-axis, uh, you have a lower critical temperature, that is a temperature below which uh, the phenomena, the, the organism freezes or dies from, the, from accumulated cold injury, and then uh, at the upper end, around 40-something degrees, you have an upper uh, critical temperature, a temperature at which enzymes denature, the animal dies. So the, the, those relationships are really, really important in biology. I've shown um, development rate. Keep in mind, oh yeah, and, and so this, this um, range in here between the upper threshold and the, the upper critical temperature is the one that's really important in the context of heat waves getting ahead of myself here. So this is the zone in which you see accumulated physiological stress. You see accumulated damage. You see organisms starting to change their behavior in response to uh, this, these threatening conditions. So, so there's a lot of stuff taking place in the zone, which is the temperature at which we see, which, which is of concern for, heat, for the, the, these heat wave environments. And I, I mentioned, I showed development rate um, walking speed increases as a function of temperature. Um, predation has a, uh, can have a neat little curvilinear function as a result of temperature. So all, all kinds of things change in an organism's biology as a function of the temperature at which it's, it's foraging at. Now, body size, um, as, and that's a well-known relationship. As temperature increases, body size tends to increase, again, in some kind of a curvilinear fashion. That's great, um, but smaller organisms eat that stuff. So we've been studying this phenomenon of heat waves and, uh, um, and temperature, high temperature effects in this community that I've been working with, Aphelinus and Dominant, um, so it's, it's based in, in sweet pepper, um, it's a greenhouse crop I work with. Green peach aphid as the host, and then two parasitoids, uh, a Braconid, a Phineas macrocariae, and an Aphelinid, um, Aphelinus uh, abdominalis. And so we, just in case you're not completely familiar with this system, uh, green peach aphid uh, takes seven to eight days to go from um, immature, first instar to adult or viviparous, um, uh, a great little animal to work with. The, green, the, the parasitoid of Phineas macrocariae takes 12 to 14 days, lays an egg inside the host, the, the larva kills the host, forms a, a mummy uh, shell of the dead aphid, um, and emerges, as I say, 12 to 14 days later. Apollanus abdominalis, in contrast, um, takes 20 to 25 days, a little bit longer to develop. 
and uh, um, has more or less the same biology as an internal parasitoid. Our general approach in the early work was to use uh, pepper plants in perforated cellophane bags. So these are confined little uh, experimental units to pop these inside growth chambers at different uh, settings uh, and to conduct 21-day experiments. Um, stop wandering around a bit. So the temperature, average temperature, the temperature at which we conducted all of these initial experiments was 25 degrees on a 24-hour average. Let me show you what that means. So we, what we did is we took the, the, the heat wave and we dissected it into um, either low frequency, that is just sort of a hot days every twice in a seven day cycle, or hot days every day, it's a heat wave environment. And we varied the amplitude of the heat pulse, either 32 degrees uh, as an upper maximum, uh, or 40 uh, degrees as the upper maximum. And all of these plots, at 25 degrees as a cumulative 24-hour average. So everything was conducted at the same, the same average temperature. Oh, and I will just go back for a second just to bring your attention to these little um, colors. Uh, throughout the presentation, I tend to use the blue colors uh, as the, the cold um, environment and hot colors as the hot environment in, in the, the various graphs. We were anticipating we would see community effects. Uh, this is the plot for green heat development rate, uh, plot for green, temp green heat shaped over temperature. Its upper development threshold is about 32 degrees. The Phidias matricariae, uh, the theoretical plot extends a bit above uh, 32 degrees to uh, an up, some kind of an upper theoretical development threshold. Apple line is the dominalis. The blue line is a little bit more sensitive to temperature and has a somewhat lower uh, upper development threshold. So what did we find? Um, in these heat wave environments, plant growth in the absence of aphids was reduced by thermal stress. So only in the, the low temperature, low frequency environment did we see we, they, those plants had slightly more leaf area than the plants that were grown under these uh, more uh, damaging or higher temperature environments. So we saw some effects on plant growth by the by themselves. Um, aphid numbers, again, in the absence of parasitoids, increased less quickly uh, in the, the heat wave environments, keeping in mind this was a log to the base 10 uh, scale. So that's actually a fairly dramatic effect on aphid numbers in the absence of parasitoids. We saw that the proportion of aliates in the population was reduced by heat waves, independently of crowding. So, what we, so as, as crowding increases, aphids generate aliates, winged individuals, which then are the dispersal units that move away from the crowding conditions. And there's a well-known relationship between crowding and the proportion of aliates in the population. However, if you do that, if you do that regression and take the residuals, What's left over is the effect of the heat wave, and under high temperature, um, high frequency uh, uh, conditions, there were there was a much lower proportion of aphids in the aphid population. As far as parasitoids go, the Phidias matricariae numbers of numbers of Phidias matricariae were lower under the heat wave environment, so we had fewer Phidias matricariae in the system where they were where they were present. Um, we also saw that aphid numbers were reduced by parasitoids in those heat wave environments, but only when the two were present, uh, not when either was present along. So it might have an interesting effect. Uh, and, and again, this is the, the shape of the, the structure of the community is actually changing as a result of this, this heat wave. Um, but there was no effect of the experimental heat wave on the trophic cascade. So that is, plant size didn't change. So the effect of the, the, effect of the reduction of aphid population by the parasitoid wasn't evident in plant growth by the end of our three-week study. So it's a, an accumulation, sort of a, a subset of some of the interesting effects that we saw in this, this set of experiments that we did. And as biologists, we look at these big, somewhat holistic ex 
experiments and we scratch our head and we say, well, well what's, what's happening? Why are, why are these effects emerging from this experiment? And this one's fairly predictable. Um, so if you think back to this development rate plot that I showed you, it makes a lot of sense. The Diphidius Matricaria should show an increase in days to develop under the highest amplitude, highest frequency temperature regime, but not under the other uh, temperature regimes. Conversely, Aphidius matric uh, Apollinus dominalis, um, the development rate of this species was increased under both of the high frequency temperature regimes, irrespective of the peak temperature. And again, that's just reflecting these differences in, in upper development threshold. And so these differences then become very important. They're part of the driver of the, the structure of this community as, as daily temperatures increase. Temperature and mortality were affected. Um, we did some studies using block heaters where we put individual insects into the uh, into Eppendorf tubes at, uh, in these uh, block heaters. Um, and then conducted a series of time, time by temperature experiments. What we found was kind of interesting. So this is temperature on the uh, one axis, exposure time on the other axis. And so Aphidius um, matricaridae, as mature larvae inside aphids, so these are aphids that are about to be killed. So they're still walking, but you can see the parasitoid larva inside them, remarkably resistant to high temperatures. Uh, we had to push things up to 44 degrees uh, for at least 30 minutes to start getting any appreciable mortality in the uh, parasitoid population. That's pretty extreme. Similarly, for, parasit for mummies that were fully formed, 24 hours old, so the aphid is dead, the, the parasitoid is starting to pupate, even more resistant to high temperatures, 44 degrees, for two hours, and we still didn't produce 100% mortality in the population. Green peach aphids, by comparison, are complete wimps. Um, even even 38 degrees uh, at for uh, 30 minutes or so is producing an appreciable level of mortality in the population. So differential mortality. Um, I, what, I'm not saying that the heat wave effects were producing mortality in the population, just that the threat of mortality is there and that the animal would have to do something about it to avoid dying. Remember, confining an animal in an Eppendorf tube and uh, cooking it is very different from confining, letting it on a plant, letting it wander around. I'm not sure why that is so. Um, we saw some behavioral effects. Pupation sites appeared to change with Aphelinus abdominalis. Um, what was happening is that under the high amplitude, high frequency regimes, so the hottest temperature every day, uh, Aphelinus abdominalis was shifting its pupation sites off of the plant and onto uh, the soil surface, onto the top surface. So they were actually moving off of the off of the, uh, the aphids that contained the parasitoids were moving off of the plant under high temperature exposure. Uh, we're still kind of working at that one. And I still want to understand who's in the driver's seat. Is it the aphid or is it the parasitoid? Uh, which is why that uh, manuscript is still in preparation. Finally, in terms of these proximate, proximate effects, keep in mind that the plant is always an active partner in these, in these, uh, in the temperature exposure. So this is the blue line. The, the green line is the, our leaf temperatures. The blue line is the air temperature. And you can see that as the temperatures reach the 30, 32 degree threshold, the plant starts to respond and actively cool its loose surface. So it's losing water, presumably, uh, to achieve a, a cooling effect. So the leaf temperature in those experiments is actually quite a bit lower than the air temperature. And similarly for the uh, 32 degree, the low amplitude regime as well. So the plants are affecting some cooling, which then gives the aphids, particularly, an opportunity to move, to move in within the plant, to shift position, to seek places on the plant that are coolest. So it gives aphids, aphids opportunities to seek refuge. So 
these heat wave, experimental heat waves that we were working with that simultaneously affected plant growth, aphid population increase, um, cost of disturbance, uh, aphid alien formation, parasitoid population increases, development, host and parasitoid mortality, and mummy formation. So there's a whole bunch of things that are going on simultaneously. Uh, you can't just tease out one effect and say this caused it or that caused the effect. It's a whole host of responses, very complicated responses. So how do we start to think about this? Well, this is this is some work that Jack Berdour and, and uh, some of his students did in uh, 2012, showing the effect of temperature on the x-axis on two components of functional response. This is handling time, which decreases as a function of temperature as the animal becomes better able to di digestion processes increase, um, the ability uh, of just straight up consumption processes change, and Conversely, um, search rate increases as, fun as a function of temperature as the animal moves more quickly and encounters prey more frequently. So these, there's two, two very important changes happening just in the context of a functional response. affect all aspects of a predator-prey um, interaction. This is just a, a standard Nicholson-Daly plot. So for those of you not familiar with it, um, the number of, of individuals that you're going to produce or in some time interval is a function of the birth rate minus the effects of crowding carrying capacity, uh, as, sorry, birth rate as affected by carrying capacity and effects of crowding minus deaths, which are a function of crowding and a function of, of predator density, which is similarly generated by these linked equations. So, great. Um, we really should be writing these equations this way, which is to say that everything, every rate in that equation, everything changeable is a function of temperature. So the the generation of individuals at some interval t is going to depend very much on the temperature at which temperature during that interval. Common sense. So let's just backtrack on heat waves. Um, heat waves have three dimensions. They have amplitude, frequency, and autocorrelation. So this is a heat wave in AC. Anything above 25 degrees Celsius is a heat wave. It's a pretty wimpy heat wave, but it's, it's what we've got in my region. Um, so if you look at this plot of the maximum daily temperature across time, you can see that there, the amplitude, the, the maximum temperature above this 25 degree threshold, which defines our, our heat wave, is it varies. So there's amplitudes, different amplitudes. Hot days occur with different frequency. Um, so in some periods they're rare, in some periods they're more common. And then there's autocorrelation, which is the tendency of one hot day to follow another. So if you have if you have a hot day, weather patterns just suggest that the next day will probably be hot as well. So you tend not to get random, random, completely random fluctuations in temperature. So a, a graduate student was working with Bernie and I, Jordan Bannerman, did some very very cool work um, and developed a, a very complicated simulation. This is just a a Leslie um, uh, population, Leslie model, matrix model. Um, and what he did is he generated each of the, tra a lot of the transitions in this um, uh, model are generated by temperature, essentially by the, the Nicholson Bailey type plots that I um, formulated that I showed previously. And he, he did, he ran this, this population simulation with temperature under. Um, nine different, no, sorry, 27 different combinations of amplitude, frequency, and autocorrelation of heat waves. So low, medium, high, low, medium, high, low, medium, high. Um, a very complicated simulation. Uh, this is just an example of his uh, of an intermediate range um, amplitude against uh, three levels of frequency. You can see uh, 
the uh, low frequency heat waves, higher frequency, higher frequency uh, hot days, and then uh, autocorrelation on this axis where uh, days tend to be a bit random, days are much more uh, closely associated with each other, and so you tend to get hot days after hot days. So you ran these 27 um, simulations and generated these a, a lot of populations as the population plot for that same simulation where populations either persisted or began to go to extinction as is quite often the case with nicholson daly type model structures. And what he found, which is really cool, which is that when maximum daily temperatures were below an organism's developmental thresholds, um, frequency and autocorrelation had no effect on, on um, community persistence. So low, medium, high frequency, uh, light, green, and black are the levels of autocorrelation, so no effects. But as soon as you start to exceed the temperatures, maximum daily temperatures were over the organism's threshold, we started to see increasing the increasing frequency and autocorrelation on days decreased community persistence in this model. So populations tended to go extinct, local populations tended to go extinct when uh, exposed to high frequency, high autocorrelation, high amplitude heat waves. Okay, I'm not too badly here. Um, so let's just, just go back to this, this notion of global climate change. So I've been talking about heat waves as, as an important component of um, global climate change. But how do we think about this when you think about the context of, of uh, future growing seasons? Uh, so we'll, yeah, we'll have longer lasting, more frequent, more severe heat waves. We're going to be looking at temperatures that are anywhere from two to four degrees higher on average during the growing season. And we're going to be looking at carbon dioxide levels that are substantially higher. We're running at about 400 parts per million in the atmosphere. We're looking at a 50% increase in about 40 years to something in the order of 600 parts per million. Um, that's going to have some big effects on agriculture. We're looking at faster growth rate in plants. Carbon dioxide is one of the engines of photosynthesis as it were. Um, and any plant physiologist in the room is probably ready to throw a brick at me. Um, we will see decreased nutrition available in plants as the carbon-nitrogen ratio shifts. This, this effect is very well documented. As carbon dioxide in levels increase in the atmosphere, plants are allocating more, relatively more in their tissues to carbon and so the plant tissues just came, contain relatively more carbon than they do nitrogen. And if you follow Harrison's green world hypothesis, uh, nitrogen is limited in, in uh, terrestrial ecosystems. Generally speaking, carbon dioxide it tends to um, increase defense compounds. Some, some pathways are upregulated, some pathways are downregulated. It's really complicated. Increases in temperature, average growing season temperature. You're going to be looking at faster growth, development, and production rates in all species. Walking speeds of predators will be faster, but um, prey are going to be escaping at a much higher rate as well. Uh, body size may be smaller for some of the species. That will be a combination of temperature and available nutrition. We're looking at more frequent encounters between predators and prey. And then, of course, overlaying this, we have longer lasting, more frequent, and more severe heat waves, which we know should reduce, heat, should reduce plant growth. We should see higher mortality, slower development, and reproduced reproduction in at least some of the species in these uh, agricultural food webs, which then contradicts or con uh, contrasts against some of these high, warmer temperature effects. So life's complicated. Now, what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and convince you that we can use greenhouses as a model for future climates and to try and start to tease out some of these, these effects. Now, this, what I'm going to talk about is a, is, a, is a holistic experiment. It's one of those horrifying experiments that graduate students should never do. Um, so in our greenhouses, we've got a carbon dioxide enrichment available, a lot of growers 
habitually use carbon dioxide supplementation in these big glass boxes. That's just how they grow. Um, we tend to average, run average temperatures above ambient because why else would you be using a greenhouse except to keep the plants and the system warm? And sunlight, solar effects, can lead to very high temperatures in greenhouses. Um, you know, you know, greenhouse effect, as it were. Um, so we can we can think about using greenhouses as, a, as as models to try and tease out some effects. So I had available two compartments and ten uh, in, in our greenhouses at Agassi, ten walk-in cages in each. And these are the walk-in cages in the background here. We set the one greenhouse at 40, 400 parts per million, essentially ambient CO2. The other greenhouse at 800. Um, we set uh, the temperature in the high uh, high temperature, the future climate regime, I'll call it the high CO2 regime. Um, so we set that about four degrees higher, we set the night cooling about four, two degrees higher, and we imposed the one to one and a half degree ramp rate. So that... A good question. Yeah. What's the, commercially, what's the level of CO2 that commercial growers... Anywhere from 1,000 to 1,200 parts per million. So they're, they're, you know, this is this is fairly modest compared to what a commercial grower would do. So yeah, they're 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 really boosting, boosting the CO2. So yeah, we have a one and a half degree ramp rate, which means that we don't allow the greenhouse to respond in an out of control fashion. The computer, greenhouse computer limits the rate the, the rate at which temperature can increase. So we get something that's more realistic, more comparable to a, an outdoor situation, and then. My uh, greenhouse manager came up with this brilliant idea to use a, a function in the computer which is called a light boost, which says when days are really bright, you let the greenhouse get hot because then the plants can take advantage of the extra light units. Um, and so we, we set a, a light boost at 350 uh, watts per meter squared accumulated light during the day, which means that uh, the greenhouse is then allowed to go six degrees above our otherwise set temperatures, generating, generating our um, uh, um, heat outbreak, our, our uh, heat wave. These are just some typical 24-hour temperatures. You can see we kind of achieved what we set out to do. Um, this is the, the lower line is the cooler environment, the high, high CO2 environment. You can see it was crossing a 32-degree threshold fairly frequently, depending, again, on how much light was available. This was a bright day. This is not such a bright day. Um, and I was able to run, conduct three runs of an experiment over time in these greenhouses. The 32 degree uh, threshold is important because that's the upper development threshold for green pH that, That's the, the line at which we decided in, in this system that constitutes heat wave. So we did pretty well. Uh, we hit our 400 parts per million target in each of the runs, got pretty close to 800 parts per million in the high CO2 regime. Temperatures were running about four degrees higher in the first run, a little closer together in the second run, and then well separated again in the, in the third run. So we got these very different um, climate regimes, um, high CO2 and a low CO2 regime. Okay. I'll show you this. This is the cumulative growing degree days with a 10 degree base. Uh, the upper line is the high CO2 greenhouse without a, without a cutout cutoff available. That's essentially the heat units available for this matter carry age. The middle line is the high carbon dioxide house uh, with a 32 degree upper threshold cutoff. That's the heat units available to green peach aphid. And then the dark, the solid line on the bottom is the low CO2 house um, with no cutoff. And, and it, since they rarely reach 32 degrees, we rarely had to impose that growing degree day cutoff uh, rule. So we conducted this experiment with peppers, uh, mice of creepy chafed, a matrix carrier. In each house, we had two cages with no aphids. That provided an index of the effect of the system on plant growth. Two cages with aphids only, which then provided an index of the effect of aphids on plant growth in the two regimes, and then six cages which had the interesting stuff, which is the parasitoids and the aphids. 
In 24 plants in each cage, selected uh, eight of those and instructed them to sample them each of weeks three, four, and five. A slightly longer term experiment than our earlier one. This is the early um, setup. Um, seed green peach or pepper seedlings. Uh, as soon as they germinated, had the first true leaf, we popped an aphid on, left, left them for a week, and then put in 12 um, Aphidius matricularia females in cage to in this kind of book. We took uh, plant height, dry, wood, dry weight of the aphids, uh, the plants, the parasitoids, we measured carbon nitrogen ratios. We, on um, four plants, uh, we took a leaf area measurement, um, counted the aphids, the ANAs, the mummies, the parasitism rates on the fourth leaf uh, from the cotyledon using that leaf because the plants were varying so much in growth rate that uh, that fourth leaf was the only one we were sure would be available. Carbon nitrogen ratios held to the theory. We got a 10 to 20 percent um, split in the carbon nitrogen ratio on plants without aphids. Um, with parasitoids, the split was very similar. Um, but when we added aphids, something really complicated happened. I only have one run available. We're still really waiting to get the results on the last two runs, so I don't want to stick my neck out too far that there's an aphid effect on carbon nitrogen ratios, but it's kind of intriguing. Um, predictably, um, but being an entomologist and not a plant physiologist, surprising to me, uh, there was quite a difference in plant growth. Um, the early, early run, so this run was conducted in February and March, this one in April and May, and this one in September and October, light levels varied quite dramatically, and that generated quite a difference in plant growth weights, or plant dry weight, uh, in the three different runs. This is the uh, week five only. And, but what you see is that there's always a split between the high carbon dioxide and the low carbon dioxide houses. Um, there's always an effect of aphids, which is quite dramatic relative to the no aphid con um, uh, index plants, and that the parasitoid uh, plants with aphids and parasitoids are always intermediate between the, the um, no aphid and the aphid um, plants. So, so great. Uh, with all this variation, how do you think about it? And the way to think about this is to think about it as think of plant weight as a fraction of the plant in the no aphid control. So plants in the no aphid controls are doing about as good as they possibly can. If you think, look at the, the plant growth in aphid only cages, so there's no parasitoids here, as a fraction of the plants without aphids, the relative effect is identical. There's absolutely, so plants are are going to be impacted by aphids, but the fact that they're being impacted by aphids in high carbon dioxide regimes doesn't really matter all that much. Um, the, the relative amount of plant, plant loss is the same irrespective of future climate or present climate. When you add the parasitoids, uh, something quite different happens. Uh, so you have a, about a 30% increase in the proportion of plant growth that is recovered as a result of um, as a result of, of the high carbon dioxide in the high carbon dioxide regime as a result of parasitoid foraging. So this is parasitoid effect on the trophic cascade. And and what you see is a, a dramatic increase in the the amount of plant tissue that is retained in the system as a result of, of um, of the foraging of the, of the effects of the parasitoids on aphid population. Parasitism rates um, increased uh, quite differently in the two houses. So we have um, parasitism rates uh, starting out when we started to measure them much higher in the high carbon dioxide house than the low carbon dioxide house. Um, probably quite predictably, both uh, peaked out uh, peaked very close to 100% parasitism. The high carbon dioxide house has started to drop. Uh, the low carbon dioxide house was staying high uh, by week five. So this is one of those situations you, you look at the, the graph and you say, dang, I wish I'd let that go another week. Um, but you know, hindsight's always 20-20 in this kind of experiment. Um, Aphid dry weights, I don't have the dry weights for the last run yet, but 
what you can see is something kind of interesting. Uh, dry weight when we first, in week three was um, about 0.1 grams of aphids, increased to about 0.3 grams of aphids, and then dropped quite dramatically. Um, in the context of Jordan Bannon's models, um, again, I wonder if I'd be leaving this for a couple of extra weeks when we have seen the population start to go extinct in those in those cages where we actually would we have seen the effect that Jordan was predicting in the context of heat waves. Uh, conversely, um, in week in the first run, aphid populations were continuing to increase. The second run, uh, quite disappointingly, was was very different. Um, the two populations started out very much the same, increased to more or less the same threshold, and then uh, aphid weights were decreasing somewhat less slowly, but I'm not sure if that was significant to yet or not yet. I'm, I'm not going to start trying to tease this apart until I have the third round available. But you can, you can see that there's, a, a, again, a trend to decreasing um, aphid populations. Of course, I cheated. Um, those first two graphs were on very different scales. This is the two, two runs on the same scale. The first run, um, aphid populations were a lot lower overall. Um, and, in the second, in, and in the second run, um, they were much, much higher. And I think there's probably some really interesting effects of average temperature um, and temperature thresholds going on in this system. Um, what's happening in, in this first run is the greenhouse the, with the, uh, in the low temperature regime never um, exceeded 32 degrees Celsius. So it never went over the develop, development threshold of the aphid. The, the high CO2 house came quite routinely. Conversely, in the second run, in the middle of the summer, um, the cool greenhouse was actually going over the 32 degree threshold quite, quite routinely. That's the average upper, uh, average maximum temperature. So which might, because these are much closer together, might explain why these two plots are much closer together. Um, and it also suggests that the upper development threshold was playing some kind of a role in the shape of, of the community in general. So, under these simulated future climate conditions, uh, we were affecting plant size and leaf area. Um, plant growth in particular was different. Uh, Carbon-nitrogen carbon ratio increased. Uh, plants may have supported greater numbers and higher densities of green peach aphid. I didn't show you the density graph, but it, it looked like there were more, more aphids per unit area in the high CO2 environment, which would make sense because if plants have a higher carbon nitrogen ratio, aphids have a harder time getting at nutrition from the plant, they would very likely be smaller. And again, this is one of those things where you take a graduate student and smack them on the back of the head or her. Um, no, I get to smack the guys, but not the girls. Um, um, because I didn't measure size of aphids one of those things where I finished the experiment. And clearly, we're going to have to backtrack and see what is the effect of that high carbon uh, regime on peppers on the effect of aphids. There's, there's clearly going to be an effect, I'm, uh, I'm almost certain. Uh, the trophic cascade was relatively larger in the future climate regime. The per capita value of biological as a result was probably higher. That investment in 12 parasitoids got you a much better return in terms of plant dry weight than it did uh, than under the low carbon dioxide regime. So you're getting a little bit better bang for your, your buck out of a biological control investment. And I think temperature range might have been might be associated with the likelihood of extinct local extinct extinction of local populations. Properly. Okay, uh, again, we go back to mechanisms. Um, high carbon dioxide uh, changed leaf size and plant size. You change leaf size, you're changing the shot size of the arena 
under which predator-prey interactions take place. Surgery on a leaf that is twice the size means something quite different. So the, 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 the arena has changed, has changed in nature. Uh, nutrition and defense compounds were likely changed. Uh, under high carbon dioxide, the salicylic, salicylic acid pathways, one of the defense compound pathways in plants, is upregulated. And the uh, jasmonic acid, acid pathway, which is the chewing insect defense pathway, tends to be downregulated. It turns out that the salicylic acid pathway is one of the major defense pathways for defense against sucking insects like aphids and, and uh, leaf hoppers and scales. So is there something going on with defense compounds? Carrying capacity of the plant seemed to change, uh, perhaps as a result of aphid size. There were interactions between individuals that were quite different and may have been quite different as a result of leaf size. Patch value, intraspecific competition, um, I think it begs us going back into the greenhouse to ask how the predators are looking at and valuing patches. Uh, is there some difference in intraspecific competition? Uh, temperature and development rates, uh, clearly, temperature clearly affects development rates, which affects generation times. It also affects foraging speed. Uh, it probably affects the cost, fitness cost, the cost of avoidance, the cost of dispersal, the cost of weaving a, uh, a suitable patch as an aphid and moving to a protected location to avoid um, damage from high heat. Uh, and the variation in range, the heat wave, uh, affected relative degree, degree day accumulations and was likely having an effect on parasitism rates. So there's a whole bunch of, so there's no answers in this slide. There's only a lot of questions. And I think what I'd like to suggest is that studies like this somewhat better plan, somewhat better thought out control in greenhouses with carbon dioxide control give us an opportunity to start asking questions about how this future climate regime is going to impact biological control and integrated pest management systems that we rely on in agriculture. Keeping in mind, um, I said something along the line of, of uh, the, the, the value of biological control was increased. I don't want to mean that. I don't want to say that as a generalized statement. It's specific to peppers, green pea chaffed, aphidious matricariae in cages in the greenhouses I was studying. It just all I'm saying is that climate change with high CO2 is likely going to change the effect of the trophic cascade, the impacts of biological control. It's not always going to change them in the same direction. I have to guess that um, development thresholds, upper development thresholds of the predators and prey are going to have a big impact on the nature of that interaction. Finally, um, this is a kind of wrap up statement. Climate change is, this, uh, there's a lot of reviews out there in, in the literature now, a lot of good reviews. Um, and all of, the, all of them suggest more or less the same thing when it comes to climate change and beneficial arthropods in agriculture. These beneficial arthropods are going to be disrupted by these future climate regimes. It's going to be highly idi idiosyncratic. It's going to depend on which natural enemy you're talking about. Without intervention, these are going to result in production losses. And those losses are likely going to justify active interventions if those are pesticides that a lot of our uh, beneficial arthropod work that we've been doing over the last several decades is simply going to fall apart. So I will leave you with some thank yous. Bernie Breitberg, of course. Uh, Michael mentioned I worked with Bernie quite extensively. Uh, and uh, Jordan Adderman, the grad student, did a lot of the modeling work. Avita, Avita Nazarene, a postdoc, uh, who worked with me. David Eric, who is my plant physiologist who shall take no blame whatsoever for my silly statements about plant physiology. Um, Peggy Clark and Chubb and you, my two technicians. Um, my wife, uh, Beth, uh, some graduate students and, uh, and co-op students who spend a lot of time counting aphids and um, giving me a hand on the lab. Jason Thiessen, the, the greenhouse tech who has been really influential in developing this 
this climate change and the people in the Agassiz Greenhouse Group and uh, the uh, Reutberg, Reutberg Lab in, in general. Uh, so thank you to all of these folks who helped bring a lot of this work to the point it's at now, and of course the funding agencies, including my employer. So with that, um, questions? Okay, let's thank Dave. Yeah. <laughs> 